The Bain Free Radio Hour. On the podcast, U9 technically triumphant and ascendant over Manticore and more. A cornucopia of Honorverse lore and a David Weber drop in. A papery broadside of Bane books for holiday giving and getting. Plus part 35 of our complete audiobook serialization of Larry Correa's Hard Magic. All right now. Welcome to the Bane Free Radio Hour podcast. It's an honor to have you along. I'm Bane editor Tony Daniel. Happy Thanksgiving. We have a special Thanksgiving podcast for you this time. Recently, we had a very cool group of people come by the Bain Studios, located here deep within the Copperwall Mountains where the peak wings soar. We had about 10 members of the David Weber Honorverse Consultant Group, BU9, with us. That gave us a studio audience, and we got as many BU9 folks as we could on microphones. And David Weber himself was present among the BU9 contingent, and he sat down to talk with us as well. It turned into a fascinating discussion that ran well over an hour, and instead of breaking it into parts, we're presenting it whole as a special Thanksgiving treat. So happy Star Kingdom Thanksgiving. After that, we continue with our complete audiobook serialization of Larry Correa's Hard Magic, as read by Bronson Pinchot. And now here's the news. The holidays are upon us, and we wanted to point out that books are already present-shaped so that they are much less hassle to wrap. What a great selection we have from across 2014, including lots of new offerings, a steady stream of mass-market paperbacks, and our wonderful omnis, novels and story collections from classic and contemporary writers bound together in one big, easy-to-hold volume. Take a look at a sampling of 2014 books. Start with upcoming December offerings, which include new Secret World Chronicle novel Collision from Mercedes Lackey and her merry co-authors. Also out will be Undercity, a great new Private Eye science fiction series from Catherine Acero, and Reiki Spore's contemporary fantasy containing vampires, werewolves, and computer geeks, Paradigms Lost, will also be out. But take a look back at the wonderfulness of 2014, and it's all still available for you to give and receive. There's November 1636, The Viennese Waltz, debut novel The Chaplain's War, contemporary fantasy The Sword of Michael. There's the new David Weber and Timothy Zahn Manticore Ascendant series. The opening novel is A Call to Duty. There's a new general series, Entry the Savior, and a new Elf Home fantasy science fiction series entry, Wood Sprites. There is the great opus John Ringo has given us in his complete Black Tide Rising post-apocalypse zombie series, Zombies Done Right and Scientifically Sound, plus some wonderful young heroines to root for. These are Under a Graveyard Sky, To Sail a Darkling Sea, Islands of Rage and Hope, and the slam-bang finale coming in January, Strands of Sorrow. There's the excellent science fiction adventure Rescue Mode, with the crew going to Mars struck by a meteor and struggling to survive, and maybe even complete their mission. That one's by Les Johnson and Ben Bova. There's the second entry in big near-future science fiction Tales of the Terran Republic series, Trial by Fire. There is an excellent Civil War time travel novel, The Ghosts of Time, by Steve White. There's a new entry in David Drake's RCN series, That one is The Sea Without a Shore. And frankly, I've only scratched the surface. How about a complete set of our wonderful Heinlein reissues with covers by the great Bob Eggleton and all new afterwards by a host of great writers? How about excellent short story collections such as the Bane Big Book of Monsters and Shattered Shields and Monster Value Omni editions of favorite series such as Empire of Man, the Prince Roger books by Ringo and Weber, as well as general series entries, Hope Rearmed and Hoped Renewed, by David Drake, S.M. Sterling, and Eric Flint. Not only that, we've got the new Bain audio drama Islands, which is available at BainEbooks.com. You can give a gift certificate for that. For the tweens and teens, there is David Weber and Jane Linskull's Star Kingdom Trilogy, 
which includes a beautiful friendship, fire season, and tree cat wars. Go to Bain.com and check out new books by your favorite author, Crapman, Hoyt, Nye, Sharon Lee, Wynn Spencer, P.G. Hodgell, Tony Daniel, so many great books. And, of course, don't forget to fill up any e-reader you get or give with the entire Bain Free Library. They're all free, 50-plus free e-books, including classics such as 1632 and On Basilisk Station. So, half a league, half a league, half a league onward, and fill your holiday shopping with Bain Books and spread that sense of wonder. I want to welcome several of the members of BU9, the David Weber Honorverse Consulting Group, to the podcast. And David Weber's here, too. And his wife, Sharon. Hello, folks. Hello. Hi, Tommy. Hi. Yes, we have David Weber, multiple, multiple New York Times bestseller and creator of the Honor Harrington series and sub-series within that universe and the Honorverse in which they dwell. Hi, David. Nice to see you. Hi, Tommy. Uh, and BU9. Uh, BU9 covers the Honorverse. These are some amazing folks who have in common the, their love and deep knowledge of the Honor Harrington universe. This is, not, this is not everyone in the group, I don't think, but we have with us today in situ, let me run down some of the people. Thomas Pope, who is the founder of BU9, which is, as we say, a collection of professionals assisting David Weber in defining and documenting the Honorverse. Tom served as lead editor for House of Steel, which is sitting right there in the middle of our podcast table, and is collaborating with David and Timothy Zahn on the new Manticore Ascendant series set in the early days of the Manticore Navy, the first entry of which is out right there on the table, uh, A Call to Duty. We did a two-part podcast interview with David Weber, Tim Zahn, and Thomas a couple of weeks ago, and that's available for your listening pleasure um, on the podcast page. Tom works with computers at the Institute for Software Research in, at Carnegie Mellon University. We have Mark Guttis. Who's Mark Guttis? There, you're Mark. Okay. We have, we have Mark. I, I will edit this. <laughs> <laughs> Should we correct you in pronunciation? Then? Yes. Yes, please do. No, Guttis is correct. Guttis is have correct. We, we, all the rest of us have been saying You've been it saying it wrong. Yeah, all, all these. Saying you didn't correct us? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> He's a lawyer. He's a fool's, fool's errand. Yeah. <laughs> just, say, just say hi, Mark. We have hi. Mark Guttis, uh, <laughs> who is a practicing attorney and doesn't really have a last name. It's more amorphous. Mark indexes and writes about the legal systems and governments of Honorverse, of the Honorverse with BU9. He's also the JAG and corp corporate counsel of the Royal Manticore and Navy. Yeah, that's, is that's that old, true? That's... You got kicked out for... Uh, because nobody could say your name? Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. <laughs> Hello, Mark. <laughs> we have Brian Haven. Do I know? There's Brian. Brian is the secretary for B9. Is that right? Um, former secretary. Former secretary. I, I managed to tag that off to Mark. Ah. Chris, you sent me all the wrong bios. I sent you all the wrong bios. I sent you the, <laughs> I sent you the bios from House of Steel because that's the one. There's actually been a handy. significant uh, amount of changes since then. I forgot about that. Well, uh, Brian is a Navy, a retired Navy submariner who went on to work for NASA and then Apple before taking over as general, general manager for Atlantis Games and Comics in Norfolk, Virginia. His contributions include general organizational support and the pointed question now and again, or so we hear. <laughs> hi, Brian. Uh, we also have Joel Presby. Um, Joel, hi. Joel is the author with David Weber of upcoming book three in the Hell's Gate SF fantasy hybrid series, or are we calling it Arcana Sharona? Uh, I guess it could be both. Only I pronounce it. Arcana. Arcana. Yeah. Got us. Got us. Arcana. I think we'll go with your pronunciation. Uh, that book is called The Road to Hell, and it will be out in 2015, so we can look forward to that. Joel also works for a U.S. governmental entity, a large portion of which floats. And that's all we can... No, it's not true anymore. <laughs> I don't think I said that. I'm a formal naval officer. I've escaped. Uh, um, we have Chris Weave. Chris is a naval analyst working for the Department of Defense. He spent six years at the Center for Naval Analyses 
as a naval exercise analysis and war game designer and five years on the faculty of the Naval War College as a war game designer and analyst. In addition to war gaming, his specialties include command and control and anti-submarine warfare. In the Honorverse, he's interested in command and control and naval tactical and operational doctrine. So, uh, who have I left out? I don't know, but I noticed Chris's Bill. was the one that was up to date. That's <laughs> <laughs> because I. The only one it's, who hasn't changed. It's, it's, I'm the only one who hasn't changed. I, I, I sent him your stuff. You have Bill's stuff? Yeah, he's, Bill. he's looking. Bill, who are you? Okay, I'm Bill Edwards, retired Navy. Uh, my forte is looking at systems relative to laws of physics and finding their weaknesses. And I'm an amateur astronomer sometimes. Cool. Um, so I guess, uh, Thomas, uh, how does BU9, how did this happen, BU9? I mean, let's start with that. Um, BU9 came about as we were working um, back when I was working with Ad Astra Games on the um, Saginami Island Tactical Simulator. And we started working closer and closer with David and at the time a um, movie production company who's since moved to other things. And we started to have deeper and deeper questions about the Honorverse. And I realized that there were many, many questions that I couldn't answer um, with my experience. And there were people that I had known or friends of friends who had I had met at conventions who would have things like people on speed dial who happen to know how many people sat in the mount the weapon mount of a Mark 13 missile launcher. And so I recruited him because he had this really cool guy on speed dial. Um, that was Chris. And then I found out the guy he had on speed dial was also recruitable, so I recruited him. And most everybody I found sort of collected, accreted this group of, of wonderful people. In South Carolina, we call Tom Kudzu. <laughs> <laughs> All Southerners um, will know what that means. <laughs> all, all of whom have, have their own unique experiences, many of which are formal, you know, many, many former militaries you've heard from the bios. Some and, people might call him a power networker instead, to be just a little bit more polite. <laughs> yeah, but, but I'm a friend. <laughs> <laughs> Some taste. Some taste. <laughs> and we just, we just grew from there. I mean, we really are a, a group of, of people who enjoy playing in David's sandbox and trying to build it as realistically as we can and fill in the sort of fill in the holes and find ways of using real world physics and, and real world I really yeah. can't literally can't overemphasize um, how good for me having view 9 come together has been um, these days you know when I'm sitting here looking at a plot concept in a book and thinking, well, it would be really cool if the battle worked this way. I say, you know, call Tom Pope. My phone says calling Tom Pope. And I say, Tom, how did we, how did I say so-and-so worked? And he's like, well, you said it worked so-and-so, but then after we talked about it for a little bit, you know, and I, I got Bill involved in it, you know, and Andy had a few comments, you know, kind of thing. This is the way it works now. And it is absolutely great from a continuity perspective. Uh, it's, and the other thing that it does, and it took me a little while to realize how beneficial this was, it genuinely becomes a collaborative project. And what that means is that texture creeps in from the other sources, the other contributors, in how thoroughly I visualize something working in the stories, in looking at angles of it that I hadn't looked at, and in explaining things to them. Uh, things come to the forebrain rather than the hindbrain of the writer. There's a lot of stuff that has been going on in here that I knew was there that was explaining the continuity, that was holding it up, but that I had never actually articulated in the books because info dumps aside, there's a lot of stuff I don't tell the readers about, okay? Um, and in working through those concepts with members of BU9, then the, the, the ability to explain it and to insert explanatory information into the books, is, it's enormously enhanced. 
And it has been a very, very good thing for me and I think for the Honorverse. Um, and it has also been very good for the um, Honorverse movie project that's going on at, uh, at Evergreen right now. Because I know sometimes you guys are like, you know, we haven't heard anything from them. There's a lot of Bunine provided DNA in what they're thinking about. Okay, now it's going into a Hollywood visual environment. So they're looking at it in, in different ways. But I'll be talking to them and they'll say, yes, Tom mentioned that to us. Oh, and by the way, Tom, the, uh, the, the uh, Terminus collapsing bomb mm -hmm. does not exist. Oh, good. It was dropped entirely. Okay. So well, I'm sure glad, to, glad to hear that. <laughs> and they were like, that, and Scott told me, he said, you know, we really had our, our doubts about that one when it came along because it just seemed like too much of a good thing. So we just edited good. down. Was that a movie, that. the movie people came up with something that didn't work? Well, it was, for, it was for their their uh, their game app that that they're doing. One of, mm -hmm. one of the challenges that you had was going to be a bomb that collapsed uh, uh, wormhole uh, termini. And Tom and I were both, whoa, <laughs> that's a heck of an energy budget you got there. You know, uh, you know, we, we, we don't need no stinking missiles anymore. I think <laughs> my answer was, um, cause he said, you know, would this, would this have a adverse effect on the star system? <laughs> and, and my answer was, you know, blink, blink. And then I thought about Duh. it and I said, well, it would probably, it would, because if you could do it at all, it's because you'd have to physically move the star onto the terminus and blow it up. <laughs> That, so, yes, you know, it would have an adverse effect on the stars. It probably, you know, lights out kind of thing. <laughs> but, I mean, you know, and, and Evergreen was fine with not using it. But we, Tom and I were afraid when we first heard about it that it was already programmed and into the pipeline. They couldn't do anything about it. But they reached in and they, and they pulled it back. And largely because of Tom's explaining to them, you know, how this, how this, my concern with it, my, my big concern with it as a storyteller was that it would totally blow the 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 tech base uh, in the books? I, you know, it'd be kind of like using force fields on their space station. Uh, it's just simply not something that's doable with with Honorverse technology. And I was somewhat uh, concerned about that. But the good news is that that Mike uh, is Mike Devlin at Evergreen. Um, is is adamant that they have to maintain the basics of the tech, yep. um, and so I just wanted to to let you know. Yep. That, that By the way, we have an interview with uh, Scott from Evergreen um, coming up. No, it's it's been on. We had it oh, last okay. we had it last summer. He oh. talked to us for an hour about how they're okay. going about everything. Something cool to look at. Well, I had to. I had a teleconference with them Tuesday that went for about two hours. Well, why don't you guys take us through the working parts of View Nine? I assume it began on technical matters. It sounds like it's it's still technical is a great great deal of, of what you're doing. What are the sh what the ships look like? What happened in the universe? The honor of the queen that precludes something else happening in Shadow of Freedom. Uh, <laughs> So what's the organizational flowchart of B9 and what do what do each of you bring to it? The we're very loosely organized. Um <laughs> <Almost spaghetti. laughs> popcorn. Um, well, I mean we are we are an all volunteer organization. Um, that's the first thing to keep in mind. We have when we make when we make serious commitments such as for House of Lies, for House of Steel, for book projects, that's one thing. But for the rest of the time we really are Doing what we do, I mean that was that was part of the um, the sales pitch that I made when I when I invited people to join, which is you get a chance to talk to David, you get a chance to do what you enjoy, and to f put it into the honorverse and then show it to David and he'll comment on it. Um, so a lot of the way a lot of what we built up in our initial library really was people's favorite whatever their their interests were. And they would explore it, and they would just go as far down that rabbit hole as they wanted. What are some examples? Can other people tell me what you've... Well, um, the degree of development that says it, um, Scott, with the, um, with the uh, awards 
and yes. the ribbons and yep. you know that would be uh, scott the, bell yeah i'm yeah. sorry who's our our token australian yeah well, you have to so, have at least one aussie in the group so uh, scott's scott's so, scott's so, cool and now i would not like to suggest that this could possibly apply to anyone else in view nine you understand but scott is a little ocd okay <laughs> just a little bit yeah he's the um, only one and, uh, and they, everyone else in the CDL. the eyes rolling? Yeah. <laughs> you can, you can probably hear those on the other end of your computer. Um, but And that's... I am too, really. Uh, but that's one of the things that makes this work, is that the folks who have an interest in, in this part of, of the universe, and one particular part of it, they just really, really dive in. And I have discovered that by and large... It really, really works well for me to say, go. And then every so often go, no, no, <laughs> no, 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 you can't do that. But to basically give them their head, especially when they're in an area that is their area of expertise, whether it's professionally or in terms of their hobby interest or whatever, this is their area of strength. And the universe is big enough and it has enough texture and it has enough stuff going on in it that there are segments of it that just naturally fit into the to the talents that these guys bring to the bring to the table. Well it sounds I mean you really use these guys then. Yeah. I mean it sounds like this is not just a fan group, this is a group that's that's become a part of your creative process. It really is. When when we did House of Steel, I did the novella in the front. All the rest of House of Steel was actually written by BU9. And they sent the drafts of what they were working on to me for comment, okay? And I would expand on a point, or I would say, hmm, that's one I'd really rather not get into, or whatever. Um, and then they put it together, and they did a, an expletive deleted good job, <laughs> okay? Um, I was very, very pleased. With it. In fact, the only thing wrong with it was there was no way in the world to get it into a single companion for everybody. So, oh gosh darn, you know, beat me, make me write bad checks. We're going to do more than one. <laughs> yeah, I forgot to mention that. And it's going to, the next one is going to be called. Uh, the next one is House of Lies. House of Lies, House of Lies yes. Um, and we are still uh, kind of, you know, figuring exactly how we're going to do the, 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 original fiction that will be part of it just as was the case in house of steel i have a couple of ideas that i think would be really really fun um but um the degree of development that goes in and and again a big part of it comes when somebody asks me a question because there's a hole that they've noticed or that they would really like answered and all of a sudden, I realize, well, <laughs> the way it is, is, you know, kind of thing. I worry sometimes that, you know, it's not so much that I'm creating this as that I'm channeling it somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> you know. there, was a, there was an interesting um, incident that occurred early on in Bu 9s career. It was actually the first time that Bu 9 sort of met as a group. So we took over the lobby of a Hampton Inn in Norfolk, <laughs> Virginia. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We disconnected their equipment from the, the big screen TV. The front desk clerk didn't even bat an eye as we start disassembling their gear. <laughs> Andy Presby connects his laptop up. Now, Andy's a, a naval officer who has a master's degree in spacecraft design, and Andy does his presentation to David, and it starts off with Andy saying, in your universe, you have X-ray lasers and gamma ray lasers, and your ships have gamma ray lasers. But if you actually do the costing of that, you would come to the conclusion that you should use X-ray lasers because they do more damage per unit cost than gamma rays do because the gamma ray lasers are just so much more expensive. But gamma ray lasers are the right answer, and I'm here to tell you why. And he then <laughs> proceeded to do... Uh, go that, through this presentation. That's classic Andyism. Yes. <laughs> yeah. And it's, uh, he then proceeded to do a presentation that included all the math. It was all real world physics about the different ways that gamma rays and x rays penetrate matter and why, from a military standpoint, you would prefer to use gamma rays if you had the choice. 
And that right there was the moment where I said, yeah, I think I'm coming back next year. <laughs> yeah. it's, and it's, it's, been, it's been cool. Bill, has, uh, Bill and Andy uh, have, been, have been deciding exactly how an impeller wedge works. Okay, which is pretty cool because it's very like important said, in honor of Yeah, it's very tactics. important, but it's like, okay, uh, yeah. Uh, that's how it works, okay? I mean, that's, that was my version of how it worked. Very well, thank you. Yes. Thank Don't you. tell FEMA, but the reason why our house flooded had nothing to do with hurricanes. Andy was trying to build a prototype in the backyard. <laughs> <laughs> I've been wondering. <laughs> Don't turn it to starboard, Andy. Well, oh. it's just... You know, and, and we've got things like, you know, we're sitting there and we're, we're talking. Somebody says, "How do you how do you steer with an impeller wedge?" Okay, I'm like, "Well, you kind of kind of works this way," you know. And they're like, "Andy is like looks at Bill. Bill looks at Andy, and Andy says, I can make that work.'" <laughs> <laughs> okay. And they they go off and they come back, you know, thirty minutes later, and it's like, "All right, here's how it works." You know, I'm like, "Okay, cool. This is great." My problem is that. My background is in history, okay? Where I am in physics and that kind of stuff is a fairly conversant layman who finished college years ago, <clears throat> quite a few. Um, and so what I've tried to do by and large is to avoid stepping on myself in explaining how I visualize this working, okay? My object has been, before Bunine came along, in, in a lot of ways, was I had a pretty fair notion of how I thought this was working that was not, you know, totally out to lunch. But I wanted to be very careful about not trying to explain it in a way which would contradict itself. And one of the things that Andy and Bill especially have allowed me to do is to feel a lot more confident about dealing with the nuts and bolts behind the the gross infrastructure of of the honorverse and what one of the things that chris has done uh for me is that when we did the um the essay in the back of house of steel the the, the companion he caused me to uh examine uh analytically and critically with someone else things that had been part of my fundamental assumptions but perhaps hadn't been fully developed because I'd never needed to fully develop them for the novels. I needed to know they were there. I needed to know they were in the background, but I'd never had to really fully articulate them. And I have found, again, that having gone through that process with Chris um, has helped me in terms of my ability to conceptualize both when I'm writing and when I'm trying to explain to someone else what's going on. It occurred to me about, I guess, what, Tom, uh, three, four months ago, that I had never really explained in the books why the telemetry links to the missiles were important. And everybody was assuming that the reason they were important is because they were like the wires for a Mark 48 from a, from a submarine. Okay. And that when you cut the wires, you know, it's on its own. From the very beginning, it was like, okay, the sensors on the missiles are a galaxy that's reporting back to the mothership. And that's where the targeting data and so forth is being refined. Yep. But it, you know, it was like this light bulb went on when I realized that I had never specifically said so. In, in any of the books. And that kind, that moment came to me more or less on my own. Okay. But there have been other moments similar to that that have come to me from discussing things with, with BU9. In addition to the technical aspect of things, we have, uh, we have Mark here who, who has looked at the history and the, uh, and the socio, sociological, whatever you want to call it aspect. Um, that seems like it would be your forte, but you you use this as well, um, this this sort of research. Well, I okay. Mark and I have discussed the history of the uh, development of jurisprudence in 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 Manticore, 
Uh, I've discussed with him what critical uh, components of the Manticoran Constitution are and so forth. But where I have the ability to conceptualize in terms of this is how it's going to work, Mark has the ability to conceptualize, well, if that's the way it's going to work, this is the way it has to be built, if, if you follow me. And I remember when we were working on the... Uh, the political structure of Manticore and how we were developing local governance and so forth and, and what we were doing with the, the titles and so forth. Um, that was a huge help. I don't know that I ever actually will use that information in a book. Well, actually, we have used, we have it, used some, it yes. Yeah. Um, it's turning up in the collaborations with Tim and Tom, um, and it turned up in the... Um, the in the the second of the Stephanie Harrington books, yes, where we're talking about you know who's who's on first when you're arranging the Sphinx Forestry Service and everything else. So you know all of this has been hugely beneficial to me. Um, which honor con was it? Well, I guess it would now be a Bunan con, not an honor con, since there are now <laughs> no, honor cons as well. They were still honor cons. Yes. This is the sixth one um, where we. Um, we talked about the original size of the House of Lords and why you can have a baron in the House of Lords who's actually senior to planetary dukes as far as the House of Lords is concerned. I can't. That was recent. It was yeah. fairly recent that we had yeah. that conversation um, a couple of years ago, maybe. But it was like it was just an issue that had never been explored in the books. Yeah. Yeah. And so when we were looking at how we're going to structure the government and so forth, somebody said, well, wait, you know, everybody on Manticore who survived the plague becomes a peer. <laughs> That's an awful big House of Lords. I was like, no, no, it's small. It's only got like 50 guys in the House of Lords. I was like, wait, Dave. <laughs> you know, I said, oh, yeah. And I needed, Andy. <laughs> I needed Andy to say, I can fix that. <laughs> okay. But instead we had to kind of, you know, uh, struggle through without him. And it works. And it is one of those things that adds texture and character to the Star Kingdom. It's the small yeah. things. I firmly believe it's the small things that go into building a believable social matrix. Okay, it's the fact that on Grayson, classic music is based on country and western. Okay, which is just one of those little things that's tossed in there and you go along and you go, say what? But it lends a character. I'd like to see a, a chapter in uh, House of Lies about that in particular. Yeah, well, they're, they're actually uh, the only place where I actually ever have anybody doing classic grace and music. It's uh, uh, Mamas Don't Let Your Babies Grow Up to Be Spacers, uh, which is, <laughs> I couldn't help myself. You know? <laughs> we, just, we just kind of went with it. For the record, we try to talk him out of things like that. <laughs> um, Sharon's generally on our side. Yeah. Um, we Our success rate is not as high as we would like. But, 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 but if we can't talk him out of it, we'll run with it to the logical, to our, the illogical extreme. <laughs> Every once in a while they'll go, but David, if you insist on doing this, this is where you'll end up. And they'll say, that'll stop him. And instead I'll go, ooh, shiny. And we'll jump right in and go. You know, the, All of these guys have had to deal with the infamous David Weber ooh shiny moment while we're talking about things <laughs> because they will say something that will send me off in a totally different direction and poor Tom <laughs> the phone conversations that we've had you know I'll look and I'll say Tom we've been talking for like four hours he's like that's okay I don't have to be up for another five you know? <laughs> <laughs> kind of well that that sort of brings me to the question I'd like to ask you guys I understand I've, I've asked this before um all of you guys, and, and women and guys, are, are highly competent individuals and, you know, at the top of whatever you're doing in life. Why are you doing this, um, playing around in an imaginary world? What do you get out of it? Well, the, uh, the sort of joke inside of BU9 is that we pay our people in fun. Yeah. So we're certainly not in it for the money um, <laughs> because there is no money. It's a, it's a net negative. Um, but we, we do it because we just... There's, we, we enjoy each other's company, so it's always good to get together and have a social aspect, but it's also good to get together and talk about a very nifty science fiction series that we all really enjoy. Now, I say that as somebody who 
when I first became a member of BU9, I actually hadn't read any of the Honor Harrington stuff yet, um, which was a very big joke for a long time. David would be going off on an explanation about something, and I'd look over at Tom, and I would mouth to him, page 13, because I had been on page 13 of On Basilisk Station for like six months by that point. <laughs> um, and then I discovered the wonderful Audible books for the series, and I got caught up. I made... <laughs> I drove all over the country that year and was able to get caught up on, <laughs> on the entire uh, Honor Harrington series. I had bought all the books as they came out. I just had never done anything with them. Yeah. But, I mean, we do it because it's, it's, a, it's an intellectually interesting background. I mean, like, one of the reasons why I do it is because I'm a naval analyst in my day job, and I can sit down and use the skills that I use in my day job to make science fiction better. I can make this better in a way that you can't do with some of the other universes out there um, because they just sort of make stuff up as they go along. Well, and it's important to me to make it better and to take advantage <coughs> of the, the information. Um, there's a series that I'm doing for another publisher, uh, Tor, um, and uh, in the... You know what the, that is backwards. It don't. <laughs> yeah, don't go there. Anyway, um, in one of the um, in the current book, the one that won't be out until next year, I'm talking about one side's ability to fight in Arctic conditions. Okay, and when you start looking at the specialized equipment and so forth that's involved in doing that, it's really you know you start the the you know the inner the the outer parka the silk lining the whole nine yards that goes into building Arctic gear. What's well, important to me to get that kind of stuff right. In the case of the safe hold book we're talking about, this is a world where I can go and do research. I can say you know how does this actually work today? Okay, when you start writing science fiction that is using a far future tech base. Okay, you're into a whole nother continuum in terms of how do you make it work. Because I write military science fiction, there are going to be elements of it that are ageless. Because the military is going to be doing certain jobs, and that means there are certain constraints that they're going to have to face. But the tools are going to vary enormously, and the logical implications of those tools on the existing structures and strategies and so forth are going to vary enormously. And it's important to me to get those details right, or as close to it as I can. And I think that that is a common thread for BU9 as a group, that it's important to you guys to get that part of it right. And the, and the readership that we have in current uh, active duty and ex-military strongly suggests to me that we are getting it right, or at least coming closer than a whole bunch of the stuff out there. Um, I don't think it's so much that folks in the military think that the Honorverse idealizes military service, although there obviously is some of that in it. I think it's that the Honorverse gets military service. That, that, that it understands the, the mindset, the consequences, the, 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 the organizational aspects of it in a way that a whole bunch of stuff that's marketed as military science fiction doesn't. Well, in uh, Call of Duty, um, the early Manticore and Navy is certainly no, not the shiniest example of, uh, of I mean, Travis, our hero, is... Yeah. Um, is thrust into a kind of time servers a lot of them uh, because they haven't had anything to fight yet yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, that's what happens to your military when you don't need it for a long time mm. the, the, the truth of the matter is that the navy that travis is in and by the way tom and tim tim zahn's name is on the cover of this book tom's fingerprints are all over it in terms of contribution not just to the tech but to the to the uh, the um, the plot line, um, but when we looked at doing a series that was going to be set 400 years earlier than Honor, I wanted it to have a distinctly different flavor because 
the England of 1714 isn't a whole lot like the England of 2014. Okay, there's going to be some common threads in there. You can see it coming. But I wanted it to be different from the, 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 from honors time. Okay. And I've done anthologies with other writers all over honors lifetime. But I wanted this to have a distinctly different flavor, both societally, societally, to me, <laughs> um, and in terms of the technology. And it is really hard for the guy who originated a technology to make it 400 years cruder. It's much hard. It's easier to go the other way. Okay. So letting Tom, he's the tech guru for, for these books. The technology in this, in these books is being built primarily by Tom, um, with him running it by me and saying, does this work for you? And so far, there may have been one thing that I said, well, no, that won't work because, okay. But it, I can do that with these guys. Okay, and it's it's been it's been really fantastic. I don't really like to share my stuff, my books and stuff, with a bunch of people because as soon as you start doing that, people start trying to grab the wheel and steer, or they they say I have written a novel which uh, clarifies the points that you have, where you've created an inconsistency in in the series or kind of thing. These guys are friends as well as associates, and I'm totally comfortable showing them anything that I've done. Uh, I know that if they have a suggestion, they'll make it. I know that they won't just go off on a wild hair of their own in, in, in some, well, okay, Tom might occasionally. Uh, <laughs> you know, but Sharon but, is giving direction. <laughs> but... but I Backseat can, podcasting. <laughs> I can I can hand this to them comfortably and confidently, and because of that, I'm completely comfortable and confident with incorporating their suggestions into what we've done without getting a not invented here mindset glued onto it. It's it's helpful that um, at least among the the people who've been with Bunine longer. No one is really afraid to tell David that's probably wrong. Um, we've, we've, I mean, we've we've come right out and said, no, it's, I'm sorry, you're wrong. Um, but also, there's not a lot of ego involved in this group, and so when David says it really has to work this way because of this, you know, because the book's already established that it works this way, we can't change that. We will turn around and we'll just make it work. Now we have made a few changes, <laughs> like the great resizing. Yeah, yeah. Um, Are you early gonna make on. that Bu9's fault? Yeah, <laughs> it was, well, it was, yeah, it was that, pre Bu9, but it involved many, some of us. It involved some of Bu9's current personnel. Some of the, some of the usual suspects were involved. Um, I basically misplaced a decimal point when I was trying to calculate the size of the ships based on what I figured their internal density. Actually, I misplaced two decimal points, um, and somebody said, you know. Dave, you know, it's really cool <laughs> that these super dreadnoughts are a kilometer and a half long, but that means they have the internal density of styrofoam. Hollow styrofoam. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Kind of In fact, I don't even think so, it's as dense as styrofoam. I think cigar <laughs> smoke was the, uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Was so the we basically, phrase. Basically, and they were right. And when I went back and looked at my notes, I was like, duh oh, you know, kind of thing. So that's why as the books went along, I think it was... Was it Honor Among Enemies? It was. It was. Pre, it was bef uh, No, it was. It was later than that. But because anyway, we didn't get involved. You you caught it before we got involved yeah. and had started to sort of phase out sizes. Well, yeah. What I'd done is I started speaking only in terms of tonnages yeah. mm -hmm. and leaving the sizes out, um, and um, that's why it's kind of like you may not have noticed that in on Basilisk Station it's referred to the People's Republic of Haven I think three times. Okay, all the rest of the time it's the Republic of Haven, it's the Havenites, it's not the Peeps. That's because originally it was just the Republic of Haven. And Jim had, Jim Bain, had a problem with that because everybody knew the Republic was the good guys and the Empire was the bad guys and manticores are man-eating beasts. And I'm like, okay, except for centaurs, everybody out of Greek mythology was a man-eating beast when they could catch them. <laughs> including anyway, the Greeks. Including <laughs> the Greeks. Um, but it was... 
we were actually, we'd already set the first book. And this was pre, you know, neat, keen, electronic revision mm -hmm. to your type time. Uh, when it occurred to me, I had this brainstorm and I came up with a solution that Jim loved, which was, we'll call it the People's Republic of Haven, because that's code for bad republic. All right. Well, unfortunately, we can only find like three places in Basilisk Station where we could put it in without changing paragraph breaks, line mm -hmm. breaks, and everything else. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, and um, The Honor of the Queen was also pretty far along in production at that point because they were released like two months apart. And so, again, there, we, we had a little more flex in there than we did in, but it's not until book three that it's routinely referred to as the People's Republic and, and that sort of thing. So it's, there's a, there's a, a evolutionary process uh, going on here. But that was one of those moments where I could have used you guys in 1993, you know, <laughs> while we were trying to figure out how to, how to make this work. And uh, Andy Presby is famous among our group for being... His his one of his favorite phrases is I can retcon that, <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> which which is would be incredibly scary if it wasn't for the fact that he's really pretty rigorous when he does things like that. He's got a physics background. He's mm -hmm. he's uh, he's a naval nuke. He 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 doesn't just go off in these wild hairs. So he's not just you know pulling things pulling things out of the air when he does things like that. Mm -hmm. um, if he had been around during the Great Resizing, we might have ended up with a much, much different a solution to that problem because there's a couple of different solutions and he's come up with another one. Um, but that would have made a lot of other things look different yeah. this, you know, 20 books later yeah. as well. Uh, yeah, in a way, in a way, calling it the People's Republic was retconning before the book was ever, the first book was ever published. So this is a long established tradition in the Honorverse. <laughs> um, I think that continuity is huge, especially in a series that spans 20, 25 years of in-universe time. There's so much room for continuity errors. And, there, and some have crept past, no matter how hard we tried to prevent it. Uh, I think it was Paul Anderson who said, uh, uh, perfect, uh, perfect continuity is possible only for the Almighty, and a careful reading of Scripture will suggest that even he got it wrong occasionally. <laughs> um, the, um, and, and, and that's true. That's very true for a series writer. A, a three-book trilogy, not so bad. But when you're up to 17 novels, oh, yeah, there, there are going to be continuity errors in there. These guys have caught quite a few that we have either fixed before they saw the light of day or have found a way to deal with without violating continuity in the books. And everybody who's reading, who's read Honor Harrington, Honorverse novels in the last, God, what, six, seven, eight years, yeah. um, owes a debt to Bu9 uh, in terms of the, the uh, rigorous way in which the books have been looked at by someone besides me in terms of how do we make this work? Did we have a problem here? It's it's just incredibly beneficial. Well, it seems like, I mean, um, that it's to maintain an entire setting in your head after over 17 books is, is, is so much energy that... Um, that you may have trouble coming up with new characters and plotting just because of the amount of uh, thinking you got to do. It seems like you feel freer because you've got these guys to offload this. Actually, that's the one downside of it. Um, because now that I can trust them to do stuff, okay, I've dialed it back a degree or two in my own head. And the degree of, of, of stress focus in, in an odd sort of way has backed off a notch or two. I know where, and we also, I should also say, the Honorverse right now has a problem, which was induced by where we are with the big reveal on the secret bad guys who've been pulling the strings all along because their masks slipped about 20, 25 years earlier than it was supposed to due to what Eric and I were doing, Eric Clinton and I were doing. The Crown of Slaves series. The Crown of Slaves series. It pulled everything forward. 
And so the Solarian League was supposed to be a lot more of a challenge to the Grand Alliance than it is right now. It's, the Solarian League is kind of in the position of clubbing baby seals as far as Manticore is concerned. And this has caused some problems in how I resolve plot lines. And I've come up with a fix. I came up with in part after a lot of discussion with Tom late at night over, you know, how do we do this? Where do we go? And uh, I think it's going to wrap up very satisfactorily uh, in the next couple of books. But part of having View 9 available meant that when I hit that problem, I stepped back from it a little bit and I said, guys, you know, you know, help me help me figure out how to fix this instead of diving into it myself and saying okay i gotta fix this on my own it's hugely hugely beneficial to be able to do that the only the only downside of it is that by taking myself off the spot sum in in that it's changed the uh the synergistic balance for for creating the story and i think ultimately it's improved it in many ways but it's definitely different for me. And it is actually a little harder for me to carry stuff now because I don't have to. And therefore, I have found myself needing to be caught by Tom more on continuity errors than I did before, partly because I know there's somebody there to do the catching. Does that make sense? Yeah. Well, you've come to rely on them, Yeah. Yeah. And who wouldn't if you had a group Well, if like they went this. away now, the Honorverse would be in trouble. Okay. Uh -huh. I'm just saying. Well, um, Thomas uh, is a Bunai member who has sort of graduated to being a co-author, as is Joel. Um, how does that process, when do you decide that Joel's going to be a writer with you? <laughs> <laughs> are, are you well, Joel. <laughs> <laughs> well, technically, I've never actually joined Bu9. I just tend to show up, but they, they accept that. Um, <laughs> we, we keep inviting her, and he keeps, she keeps saying no. She's, and, a, she's, <laughs> what, she's what in the South we call a Mary Inn. <laughs> okay. <laughs> very true, very true. But, but very uh, unfair. She, she, she's earned... Uh, she earned her invitation through her own merits. Oh, absolutely. Um, and, but she keeps saying no. Um, Wise woman. <laughs> <laughs> We're a scary crowd. What, is no. it, uh, what does the IRS say at arm's length? Well, I think I need to blame uh, Sharon and also Gina um, to, to put the, the two people on, on the spot for how it is that that I think it came to be that I was eventually co-writing a, a novel with David Weber, not even in the Honorverse. Um, you, I'm sure readers are aware that David tends to write long things. And so at some point, Tony Weisskopf asked David to write something short for Bain.com. <laughs> and David is a very knowledgeable, bright, intelligent man and knows that he likes to write long things. So he turned to Bu9 and said, would anyone like to write something short for Bain.com? And and several people did, and um, I was one of them, but I, I didn't actually have very much confidence in what I'd written because it wasn't uh it wasn't technical. I wrote a short story in the honorverse, but I liked it a lot. So I, I shared it with Tom Pope and with with Gina, and Gina shared it, I believe, with Sharon, and uh, Sharon uh, gave it to David without telling me she was going to do that, <laughs> and and what shockingly to me, <laughs> <laughs> David liked it, and Tony accepted it, and it went up on Bain.com, and um, I didn't get very much hate mail, and so... <laughs> um, no, it's one of our most popular uh, articles in terms of hits. On the on the website. And what would the name of that art of that story be? Nobody's actually said the name yet. Uh, <laughs> I believe Grayson the final Navy. title was Grayson Navy Letters Home. I, mm -hmm. And uh, the an reason it gets so much story. it is it's it's, it's cool. letters back and forth. And the reason it gets so many hits is because um, my mom logs into it three hundred thousand <laughs> times a day. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, mom. I love you. <laughs> she has her software set up. <laughs> well. The, the, the story, I liked the structure of the story, which is not the way that I would have approached writing the story. And that's one of the things you look for in a collaboration, is somebody who's going to do things differently 
from the way that you would do them. Okay? And that's one reason why I'm so comfortable working with, with Tim on, on yep. is, yep. you know, I have total faith in his writing style and it's different. So Tim's he's going to come at it from a different way. Yeah. Tim's on. Yeah. Now, Joel came at this from a direction that I really, really liked when I saw it. And then she did um, Obligated Service, obligated in service for the last anthology. Uh, which kind of, in some ways, builds off of the the letters from Grayson, um, letters to Grayson. It's it's this, and it deals with something that really needed to be dealt with that I'd never dealt with, which is, this is this incredibly patriarchal uh, culture, which is doing a real fast forward to integrate women into its military from a standing start where they weren't allowed to serve on juries. That is Grayson. We're this is Grayson, about, yeah. not Manticore. Yeah. Um, and I've done so much from the Manticoran perspective that I'm fully aware of this conflict, this, this, how hard this is for them, and how hard it's going to be on some of the, the women involved. But I am so locked into the Manticoran perspective that it is a little difficult for me to do, it would be very difficult for me to do a full-length story from the Grayson perspective from the outside in. And the fact that Joelle has military background as a female person, okay, certainly doesn't hurt one little bit either. But she got her head inside. Where are the Graysons going to be coming from in dealing with this? And did it very well and very convincingly. And so I was very, very pleased with it. So when we started looking at um, bringing the uh, the uh, Hellscape series uh, back up and, and getting it running, I asked Joelle, and she foolishly said, yes, I would be willing to give it a try. And I haven't changed my mind. <laughs> <laughs> so how are you working together? Uh. <laughs> right, basically, basically what we've done is the... There was a lot of material that already existed for where the series was going to go. It was always designed to go to four books from the beginning. So there's a lot of material, tech Bible, background reference, uh, geographical notes, etc. that I could hand Joel, you know, and I could hand her, this is our original manuscript that we took apart, put back together, that I could hand Joel. I am doing a particular portion of the book, dealing specifically with the the, uh, the military aspects of the of the campaign and whatnot, and Joel is basically doing um, just about everything else, uh, the, polit- the 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 social front, the the home front, the politics. Uh, she has brought in uh, an entire thread that really needed to be addressed, but that I hadn't had any thoughts at all about how to address, and she's done it very well. Um, I think that Joel has discovered that um, this is um, a major project. Uh, I think she knew that it was going to be going in, but I think that she has done a little bit on occasion of sort of psyching herself, worrying about whether or not she was up to the job. And I am here to tell you that, yes, yeah, she is definitely up to the job. Um, in fact... Where she gets into the most trouble is when she starts trying to to hold her word count down to restrict herself <laughs> the first time through. Okay, so I finally told her, just write it however long it has to be. Trust me, they're used to long books with my name on the cover. Okay, and and we can we can you can always edit down. You can always edit down, but don't starve yourself for what needs to be there for the natural flow of the story. And I think she's become more comfortable with doing that. It's definitely getting longer. I'll Definitely. say that for sure. There you go. I kept okay. trying to to tell the story <laughs> with few words to leave sufficient room for David, and yeah, it's and not I, possible. <laughs> I, told, I, told her, I told her write it however long it has to be, and we'll look at it when we get to the end. You know, I mean, you know, if if we come around to Bane, we say. Well, we we got it down to seven hundred and eighty four thousand words. Then I think Bain will probably say, "Well, there's a little problem here, Dave." Um, but I, I don't think, think they call those trilogies. Yeah. <laughs> right. uh, I don't. I don't think. Whoops. Well, um, I don't think that we are going to have 
that big a problem. It's not going to be like when John... Oh, look, the screw came out entirely, Sharon. No, it didn't. It just let go entirely. We had a glasses problem. I'm sorry. The lens fell out of my glasses while we were sitting here talking. Um, the... Um, um, what was the thread we were Arcana, talking about? Sh- Arcana, Sharona, and, Kurt yeah. and, and collaborating with Joel. Yeah, the, well, and, um, she mentioned Trilogy, and your eyes ah, popped, and that's yes, my glasses fell <laughs> <was going last. laughs> <laughs> No, okay, I, no, we were talking about, we were talking about word count, okay? Um, we're not going to wind up with 500, what I was going to say, it's not as bad as it was with John Ringo. When we started the, the the Prince Roger collection, and he called me and he said, he said, I'm up to I'm up to a uh, hundred and eighty thousand words, and I said, good. He said, no, I'm a third of the way through the outline on the first book. What? So I said, well, yeah. send it to me, and I'll see what we can. <laughs> he sent it to me, and it really was not a lot in there that I wanted to cut because it was good. So I called Jim, and I said, Jim, you know those two books that. John and I were going to do? And he was like, yeah. I said, how would you feel about maybe three, four, five? <laughs> you know? And he said, oh, I can stand it. Um, so that's basically um, where we were on that. Um, and I have found that Bain is very good about letting the story be as long as the story needs to be. Most of the times when I have cut or divided into two books what I'd originally intended to do in one set of covers, that's been my decision, not Vane's. Um, as a matter of fact, I can't think of a time that Vane actually said to me, whoa, Dave, you know, this is too long. We, we, need, we need to cut. Um, well, you've seen some of the spine sizes of what we put out. <laughs> yeah. Well, especially the paperbacks. The paperbacks get scary. In a hardcover, it's like, okay, it's this thick. But then when you go to paperback size pages and type, it's all of a sudden like, wow, that's a big one. <laughs> the, the storytelling is, is what comes first. The, milieu, the setting construction. Yeah. Like all the things you need to do to make it good. Yeah. Well, and you know, I think one of the things that storytellers frequently don't know why they do something in telling a story until after the story is told. Uh, the example that I've used, the classic example for me, is the decision to kill um, Andrew LaFollette, Honors Armsman. I thought I was going to have to move to Montana and raise rabbits under an assumed name <laughs> when I killed Andrew because he was so important to Honor and he'd become so important to the characters. And that's why he had to die. Well, <laughs> well, I tried. I tried five, six times to write that chapter without killing him. To write it with him surviving, and it just did not work. And it wasn't until actually the arc came out that I realized why it was that I couldn't not kill Andrew. And the the reason was Honor loses ninety eight, ninety nine percent of her family when Sphinx is damaged in, uh, in the attack that takes out the space station. But you never met the vast majority of those people. They're hugely important to honor, but the reader never met them. The reader does know Andrew, and he knows how important Andrew is to honor. So he can extrapolate from the loss, the anguish she feels, when she loses Andrew, her perfect armsman, who saved her life three or four times, and she saved his. She's, she's assigned him to be her son's armsman to keep him out of harm's way when she goes back off to war. And while she's off negotiating peace, he's killed, saving her son's life. And from that loss the reader is able to make the move into what it must be like with all of the other people that she lost at the same time. So it's a part that represents the whole. Then, yeah. 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 But as but as the storyteller, I didn't realize that was what it was until I got to that point. Then he, then you you made it the way it had to be, mm-hmm. even at the even when it was in the advanced reading copy. Yeah. Wow. So let's, uh, we're going to have HonorCon this weekend. Um, what is HonorCon? How did this this uh, get-together start? Can we, uh, 
<laughs> do you want to do that, Tom, or shall I? Sure. Well, the first Honor Con was Bill and I um, visiting USS. <laughs> this, View 9 does a lot for me. <laughs> yeah. They even put my glasses back together with the lens pops out. Thank you, um, Tom. You're welcome. The first Honor Con was Bill and I visiting, was it USS Normandy and um, <clears throat> Cole um, yeah. at the um, Norfolk Naval Yard. And I had asked, uh, we were, I didn't, I'm, I'm one of the few people in Bunai who has no connection whatsoever with the military other than having most of my friends being either at military, ex-military, or civilians working for the military. So I'd never been on board a warship before, and, and Bill served for many, many, many years on them. Um, and so he was willing to walk me around and sort of teach me, teach me the ropes. Um, and that was effectively Honor Con Zero. Um, it was the two of us walking around, me learning about how warships were really put together, how th how you know when you're how you maneuvered through them, how they worked, how they fit together, how the people all crammed into them. Why you have um, shin breakers? <laughs> why you have shin breakers? <laughs> um, why every time there's a sign in the navy that says you know things like ammunition far side, there's a story behind that. It's sometimes humorous and almost always fatal. <laughs> um, um, so you know a, a lot of the you know a lot of the lore I learned that way, and we um, we enjoyed that and decided that it was really worth um, making this something that we would do as part of the larger group. So the next year there were uh, actually I think nine of us. Um, this was before Bu Nine had a name, um, and there was a bunch of us and David. We went on another couple of visits in Norfolk mm -hmm. and. Um, so HonorCon grew from there to becoming the Bunine annual meeting over the next three or four years. And then last year we decided it was time to, to make a real convention um, to help celebrate the 20th anniversary of the Honorverse. And um, also Evergreen at that point had come on the scene and they had a lot of, a lot of exciting announcements. The um, movie company. Evergreen Yes, yes Evergreen Studios, Studio, yeah. the movie company. Mm -hmm. Um, and this year, the tradition is continuing. We've handed over to the fan club who are running the convention this year, and hopefully this will be, um, there'll be many more from now on. I, I remember last year, just amazing to see the everybody in uniform getting together for that group shot. That was, that was, yeah. That was yeah. so cool. Yeah, it's really, it's a lot of fun working with the fan club. They're incredible folks. They, they really are. They're... Um... They're almost extended family in, in a lot of ways now. We call them the Royal Manticore and Navy, correct? Yeah. Is that the... Uh, yeah. That's, and we're, we're going to do a remote podcast at HonorCon with, um, with the leadership of the RMN. That'll be great. So um, every year um, from now on, probably you're going to be able to come to an honor. One could come to an HonorCon. It's a continuing tradition. Now. Yeah, I, I, I believe and hope so. So, what's Wither Bu Nine? Um, just keep keep on keeping on. What's um, what do you think could happen? So. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we're we're that we're as as Chris said earlier. Bu Nine pays in fun, and as long as we're still getting paid, we're going to keep doing what we do. Um, we have uh, well, we have a contract for House of Lies, so we're working on that. Um, we will most likely go from there to um, House of Shadows is a tentative um, planned. Um, there may be a fourth House of Book, depending on sales, and we certainly have enough material to fill one. Um, <laughs> um, Not a problem and, in, a, in a Weberverse, you know. <clears throat> I, and really, we're just we're going to continue doing what we do. We're going to continue working with David and continue enjoying it. There are some folks in B United, but besides just Joel, who I realize is not officially part of B9, there are some folks in B9 who I think could be producing material of their own. Um, and, I mean, that, that's in part, that's that's sort of what Tom is doing here with, with Tim in, in, a way, yeah. in the Manticore Ascendant series. Um, I'd like to see more of them. Um do additional short fiction uh, or or longer fiction. Um, I've actually thought about doing basically a Bu Nine based Honorverse anthology. 
uh, where I'd make all of them go out and write something, you know. Uh, uh, that could be cool yeah. and lucrative. <laughs> well, I don't know. You know. We, we can't have that. You know, no, it's no, paid no. in fun. <laughs> what, in the black? No, no. no. <laughs> okay, yeah, I, I'm, the, I'm the one who first tossed out the paid in fun. I should point out to anybody out there who thinks that Bain is taking advantage of us because they certainly are. Because they're not. <laughs> I, hey, some I, people like that. I, I don't want anybody to think that Bain is taking advantage of us and not actually paying us in money. Um, and so, it is. And I'm, it is. I'm taking advantage of the So when we say that we get paid in fun, it's like the, the, the vast majority of the stuff we do, we do because it's fun. Um, when we do the companion, the people who get paid in actual money are the people who did the not fun parts of putting things together. You know, it's it's a lot of fun to go and hang out with David and climb around in a ship and talk about the universe. It's a lot less fun when you're writing something on a deadline or like when um, when I, when uh, Kay Shelton and I are doing the copy editing of the book and, you know, things are moving along and we have to go through it. You, there, there's a lot of stuff in producing the, the companion that's that's sort of not fun work. And so that's that's why that's where the money comes in. But the amount of money, you know, like I I figured out one time how much money I made off of the the companion, and I think I ended up spending like three or four dollars for every dollar I made off of that book. Um, now I got to spend that money by driving down to David's house and sitting with my friends in David's living room, having conversations <laughs> about the book. But you most know, of, most of that was in code red. Yeah, yeah. Most of that was in code red, my drink of choice. So, so that's how that works out. I did feed him spaghetti a time or two, though. Uh, yeah. that's, yes. true. that's true. Yes, indeed. And it was good. When, when's authors feed you? Again? <laughs> and there's a there's a lot of Bunine people who aren't sitting around this table. Yes. Um, that are very important contributors. How big if, is the group? Do you think? What are we at now? Twenty four, twenty five, I think. Um, we have, we're sort of amorphous, especially when you get to the edges. We have um, some some folks who are in the Verge? process of, what? Verge systems? Verge systems. <laughs> yeah. No, because like that's a really cloud. bad example to use. <laughs> yeah. um, B9's yeah. Office of Frontier <laughs> <laughs> Security has not yet <laughs> occupied these um, people. <laughs> But as far as I believe, that, as far as the people who directly contributed to House of Steel, I think there were 24, and there's another half dozen or so that are working with us in one aspect or another. Yeah, and there, there's some people that do very specific things. There are some people that are jacks of all trades, um, you know, they're, that we can just sort of say, we need somebody to do this, and they'll go, oh, I can do that. Um, yeah. Like, um, there's people like, like Barry Messina, who I don't think actually wrote a single word that ended up <laughs> in the companion but Barry has this amazing ability to read something and say, here's the thing that's like the 800 pound gorilla that you never noticed. Mm -hmm. So Barry's yes. the one who, who's able to say, you know, here's, here's this, you like, you totally left out the part <clears throat> where the Admiral's aid is coordinating with all these other people to make this happen. And as a result, that scene wouldn't play out the way it is because if it does, it implies that the Admiral's aid is a total and complete schmuck. And you've already explained, you know, you've already demonstrated this person isn't a schmuck. So now you've got this problem as to why there was this total and complete system failure that you guys didn't even notice. Yeah. That's the sort of thing that Barry would, would, would say. And we just go, Oh. Yeah, you're right. He was also <laughs> to fix that. He was also very, very useful to you and Tim, yes. wasn't he? When you were doing yes. the basic training, the basic training, and actually a large part of how um, how the Navy this, can this function. would be the yeah. Manticore in, in, yeah, in the Manticore Ascendant. Yeah, and Barry, Barry's a retired Navy Travis officer. Yes. Travis's, Travis's book. Yeah. yeah. So I spent a lot of time. I mean, I called out to to um, all you know all of the military, ex-military people in Bu Nine, asking questions. Joel gave me a lot of career advice or sort of career path <laughs> advice, as it were, um, for how we could trace Travis's career. Barry talked about that. Chris talked about that. Barry also, Barry and a couple of other folks had a lot of wonderful boot camp. Um, stories. Um, Barry is this person who you can ask a a what seems like a simple question and get a ten page response that 
goes into an immense amount of detail. Yes, yes. It's well, yeah. Anybody else around? Yeah, we don't know anybody like that. You also have a you also have a, a bevy of artists and graphic designers, and we should yeah. mention that House of Steel has a, a four color. Uh, Yes, sixteen-page yes. insert with all kind of really. Yes, cool I'm holding it up stuff. to the microphone now. Yeah, see that? <laughs> nice. Huh? Yes. yes, every every piece of art in there. Uh, the all the final art was done by Thomas Maroney. Um, he is our our primary artist. I did a little bit of the line art. Um, in general, the the workflow for the line art um, and some and much of the color work was. Um, I would sort of sketch something out that was kind of trashy and thomas would make it look really really good you, know, you did you did all the line art for call of Duty. i did i did do the art in call of duty all for duty call to duty oh, sorry um a call to duty. a call to duty <laughs> but tom thomas is, has really he he has over the years he was one of the first people he was actually one of the very first members of bu9 and we spent many 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 hours on skype or on instant messenger talking about how systems work and building systems, especially some of the early things like um, the small craft. And um, I remember we went through seven revisions of that until we had something we were happy with, sent it to Dave, and he said, nah, that's really all wrong. And <laughs> so we went back to the drawing board. He's, aside from the a lot of the early technical art and, 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 and building some of the technical background as part of the artwork, Thomas also really effectively defined the visual language of the Manticore Navy. Yeah, I, I would say that the Honorverse books have one of the strongest visualizations um, as, as part of the universe. Uh, this is what they actually look like. And an awful lot of that has come out of Bu-9. Bu-9's been working with David Mattingly on his covers. Um and uh, the cover for House of Steel, obviously, you know, they had uh, a lot of input in, but it's it's contributed a lot to that visual footprint of of the Honorverse, and I think that's contributed um, to the fan club. Mm -hmm. I think that's a big factor in the fan club's ability to identify. Uh, with the Honorverse when they're looking at, okay, we can make a uniform that's right because there's somebody who knows what the right uniform looks like. You see what I'm saying? And that really comes out of BU9 and to a huge extent, taking what I had described to them and turning it into a visual format. It started with um, the Saganami Island tactical simulator, yep. uh, with the with the um, which is the, the the board game that was developed, the tabletop miniatures game. Um, when the, the the rule books and the background books for the game were put together, that's really where Thomas started. That's where he started. The that's process where he that has led this. eventually to this. Yep. Uh, so it's been ongoing for twelve years. Um, it been eight or eight or nine, I think. Okay. I think eight or nine years. Two thousand eight. Yeah, but th these, we started. We started, started a couple of years. That. Started before that, but that's yeah. when it came out. Yeah. yeah. Well, well I mean, we met at uh, Tom and David and I all met in person for the first time at uh, at um, Philcon. Mm -hmm. I'm sitting here wearing my Philcon T-shirt, but I think I bought that weekend um, at Philcon. Uh, in 2005, if I remember correctly, yeah, I think November right. 2005. I think that's right. yeah. yeah. So, and by that point, the game was already out. I can't remember if the Jane's Guides to the Galaxy were Jane's out had yet. not come out yet. That so was the the game was out at least in 2005, and it was fairly new at that point. Yeah. yeah. And that's sort of what sort of got Bu9 together. I mean, Bu9 went through several phases. First, we were a group of people that all had sort of some sort of connection to that board game in some way, shape, or form. And then the first per, uh, people who tried to do the movie came along, and we sort of became a mailing list of people that were sharing ideas back and forth in support of that project. And then uh, Tony Weisskopf came along and said that there should be a companion, and David said, I know just the people to do it. And then there came this point where Tony didn't quite know how to sign a contract with a mailing list. So, <laughs> well, what I, hey, so she's we, brilliant, but some things are a little bit too much. Well, I, 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 when, I told Tom that these guys, okay, they really needed to organize themselves 
yeah. to, to, to incorporate. Um, because they were putting all this time and all this effort in, and they needed to do it in a way that would allow them to get the recognition that they deserved, and also hopefully at least pay some of the bills that they were incurring putting this all together. So and the that, Udine is a corporation, an actual. We are a yeah, we pay S corp. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we we're we're an yeah, S corp incorporated in the state of Delaware, if I remember correctly. Yep. Yep. And yeah. I can't know, believe yeah. that there's nobody incorporated in Delaware. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah you know, um, Panama. And, and, we haven't figured out how to pay Uncle Sam in fun yet. We're working on that. <laughs> <laughs> but um, if if I can take a moment to go back to some of the artists that we have. We oh, have, please do. Please we do. Have, yes. We have some folks that have some incredible self-taught talent. Um, John McDonald has taken... O'Donnell. O'Donnell, sorry. I, that's what I meant to say. <laughs> Not nearly enough coffee today. Um, John O'Donnell has taken the line art um, from House of Steel um, and turned them into some incredible 3D renderings. Um, and he's done how many classes at this point? I think almost all... Almost all. All of the Manticoran classes from House of Steel. He's done at least a dozen ships yeah. in a. He's English, right? No, no, no John O'Donnell. Yeah. Nope. No, okay. he's from get... the Midwest. Okay, he's, he's Ohioan. So Ohioan. Okay. Well, Soon to be English. South Carolina. Is that, oh, is that kind of is that, is that kind of Irish? Ohioan. Yeah, kind of Ohioan. Sure, <laughs> But um, not only has he taken these these line arts and turned them into three D, some beautiful three D renderings. He's we're actually going into the internal systems of the ships. And, and working on those and figuring out how stuff actually fits. This is never ending. Um, this is a project you can spend your. Oh, you yeah, could spend yeah. um, a multitude of lifetimes on. And, and John's work is one of the things that um, really, other than a couple of Facebook posts we've made and a couple of things up on our website, nobody outside of Bunine has seen. Um, there's a lot of internal work on these ships that's been done on how, how the missile systems work, how the launch systems work, that John has drawn, Bill has worked on designing. Um, we've all gone over and, and, and refined. Um, and one of the things we'd love to do, and we're still figuring out how we can do this um, with the time we've got, is to make, is to somehow get that out there. A what? huge amount of uh, what we do when David has a section of a story, we go through the routine of how would this actually work? And when Andy Presby and I get together, uh, as Chris said, Andy has a degree in physics. I just play at it and, and pretend I know what I'm doing. But we'll it, get together it, and say... It is a little better. Now. Bill's lying, by yeah. the way, but that, go ahead, Bill. Yeah. We'll, we'll <laughs> say, David has this topic. How would it work? How would it affect surrounding systems? And on and on and on. Like, you never see much in the way of an honorverse bathroom. And realistically, rightfully so. It's hard to write an adventure around such endeavors. Well, it's, it's not hard to write an adventure around it. It's hard to write one that will fit in a PB but, universe. <laughs> <laughs> but in trying to say, okay, instead of some other science fiction, like you push a red button and this happens, we want to get into what's the background behind it. I like to wait, since I've seen some of the stuff that David has in his stories, What's the, I keep tabs on a lot of the scientific and technical research stuff, and I look for little gems that are applicable. Like, how would you still know a wormhole junction is functional? And I found an article based on that, how to check it out from one side or the other. Um, and sitting here in some of the discussions on some of the artwork that's going to be in my presentations, a lot of which is based on John O'Donnell's work. Mm -hmm. I was taking a look at one area of the ship designs. It's called the polygons, or the barrels of the future on top of the ship. And Andy and I had discussed, well, this is what they do. And then realized how they functioned. I just realized how the sidewalls work. So there's always something that we can pin a real-world event on or extrapolate on that may never see the light of day in David's stories. But it's there as background if it's needed for part of the plot. And, and this is part of what I was talking about, about the, the multiple viewpoints exposing things. 
that one person would never have been able to do. I mean, I was doing a fair job of of keeping all the balls in the air before Bunine ever came along. But now it's like instead of one person maintaining a fountain of balls, okay, there's a whole team of jugglers here uh, with stuff going back and forth, which is just, you know, hugely uh, beneficial to the entire entire process. Um, one thing that we that's being kind of interesting is partly because the Honorverse is as thoroughly visualized as it is, some of the fan base is being um, concerned over what's going to happen in any movie production of the of the books because it has such a strong visual input because we've done so much to build this is how the systems work this is how the fit this is how the physics work there's a concern that Hollywood is going to screw it up okay um, and it would probably be overly optimistic to say that no, Hollywood's not going to screw it up at all. I, the example I like to use is the Lord of the Rings. There's no hardcore Tolkien knight, including me, that can't rattle off a dozen things Jackson did wrong. Okay? But at the end of the day, most of us say, but damn, he did a great job. All right? Um, and I'm, that's what I'm hoping for in the Honorverse. And it helps that uh, Mike Devlin, who is the, the main guy uh, at Evergreen, is a self-described Honor Harrington fanboy geek. Um, and that all of the principles involved inside Evergreen have read all of the novels uh, in, in the series. Uh, now, that doesn't necessarily mean that their screenwriters have, okay? But the <laughs> folks who are making the, the final decisions have. But I do foresee uh, a situation in which because we and with these guys help especially have done such a strong job of telling people how the literary honorverse works all right we're going to we're going to have points in there where committed fans are going to say but it doesn't work that way okay um they've been very good about consulting me about this is what we want to do this is what we want to do here um and they've talked to tom uh, a good bit too yep. um so they are reaching out but exactly where the final mix is going to come down at this point um in the comic books uh we've done plug uh six comic books that cover the the time of basilisk station there are occasional panels in there where you get this this gorgeous detail and so forth that actually is substantially uh, more fully realized than most of the panels in the book. Those are concept art from Evergreen that they gave to Top Cow that are inserted in. So if you go back and you look at the comic books, you can see some of what they're evolving here for the imagery and so forth of of the universe, how they're visualizing it working. Um, and I think some of that is pretty darn impressive. Oh, and uh, Tom, I, they, they are going to do smaller, smaller fusion rooms. Oh, good. Yes. Good. Yes. Okay. yes. Perhaps smaller nemesis. <laughs> no, no, well, actually, there's very interesting discussion going on with Evergreen about nemesis. With fur? Um, he will have fur, yes. <laughs> well, you have to, okay. The, my understanding of what happened is that the concept art they gave to the artist had no coat on it because they were trying to visualize musculature. And he didn't realize that. Okay, so he did a naked Nimitz. And then the problem was, what do we do with naked Nimitz? How does he suddenly not be naked anymore? Um, and so we were like, okay, well, we'll kind of leave him where he is till we start the next tranche because they're going to change artists with each group of, of uh, and they are going to be taking a somewhat different approach with future comic books um, and that is that rather than trying to do the novels 
faithfully one after another. They're going to approach this more uh, the way that we approach the anthologies, where people do short stories set within the main stem of the honor verse, which will let them reduce the cast of characters to some extent and focus more on character-driven plot and so forth. Um, and my initial reaction to this was, oh, I don't know, but the more that we talked about it, the more I think they're onto something here. Um, yeah. Uh, as, yeah. I mean, comic book retailing is what I do. So that's, uh, that's going to be probably better received by the, by the readers yeah. because you can introduce new characters, you can introduce new plot lines that are going to be short. Yeah. You've got 32 pages. Yeah. Go. <laughs> well, Scott, uh, Scott Krupp at, uh, at Evergreen and I were talking specifically about this on Tuesday, and he said that their research mm -hmm. on it, they said the first issue was very well received, and that normally is the case, you right. know. Uh, but they said, you know, we've already reached the audience that reads the books. Mm -hmm. And what we're talking about here is reaching additional audience with stories that are part of the honor verse but may not be part of one of the novels. And the way that I've worked with the anthologies all along is that people say, this is the story I'd like to write. And I'll think about it and say, well, this is when it would have to be set or, or whatever. And then they go and they, they come up with the concept and they usually write the story and then they send it to me and I say, okay, this is what we need to change or whatever. And all along the anthologies, I've been incorporating elements from the stories in the anthologies into the overall honorverse timeline, the, the 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 spine and the body of the honorverse. Um, and so I really do have I really don't have any problem at all with what Evergreen is talking about doing here. And they've stressed to me that they want to be very careful that they don't do anything that's going to violate the continuity of the timeline of the books. Okay. Yeah. But that's where we are on that. Well, um, can you sum up uh, for us this, this symbios symbiosis of, uh, of you and Bu9? And um, what's We're it like all mean, rash. David? We're like a rash. Well, <laughs> let, me, let, me, <laughs> let me tell you how it looks from my side. And then I think, you know, from Bu9's side, because they're the ones who are. The best compliment that any writer or storyteller can be given is that somebody actually cares about the stories they've written, about the characters in them, about what's going on in them. And in that respect, having these guys come together to work in the Honorverse is one of the most profound compliments that I have ever been paid as a writer. And it means an enormous amount to me in that respect. It means a lot to me in the sense that we have become friends, not just people who read my books. They are people that I can talk to about the innermost working of the books, and I don't have to worry about, you know, it's turning up on a website somewhere when it was something that I was thinking about that might never come to pass. Um, they are people who I can rely on to give me honest critiques, to say, I don't know, Dave, you know, kind of thing. Uh, they are people who I can rely on to help me solve problems. And they are people who, completely aside from the professional aspect of how they contribute to what I'm doing and the rest of the story, they are people who have become important to Sharon and me as people, um, as, as uh, members of, of an extended kind of honorverse family. Uh, so the benefit to me from BU9 comes on so many levels that it's impossible to really separate them and parse the relationship as to what's more important. The fact that Tom knows the nuts and bolts of the Honorverse in and out, or that at Honorverse cons, his kids and my kids go off to do stuff together, uh, and that I can call him and say, yeah, uh, Megan had to have oral surgery, 
you know, last week, you know, and times like, oh, how did it go? I mean, you know, this is this is not just a business or a writing relationship. Um, and I think that's what makes it as, as strong and really as productive as it is, is that it works on so many levels. Yeah, I, I would agree with all of that. Um, I mean, from where we're sitting, there's the, the personal aspects that you talked about. Um, we're, we're honored to call you our friend. Um, and in addition to that, I mean, we're, we're all people that have some sort of, I'll call it a professional skill set, even though some of us don't use the skill, our B9 skills in our day job. Um, but some of us do, a lot of us do. And we have this professional skill set that we can use to help make the universe better. I mean, we're fans of the books. We are able to contribute, and our contribution is welcomed, which is one of the things that we've all got stories about talking to authors or talking to people that are somehow associated with science fiction, and there's this attitude of, why are you bothering me with the details about this? We just kind of make this up. And... One of the things that, that sort of draws us to this particular topic, the reason why we're BU9 and focused on the Honorverse as opposed to being Star Wars people or something like that is because we can, you know, we can have this consistent conversation. We can play in this universe and we know that not only can we entertain each other by having these conversations, but when we talk with David, his response isn't, you know, why are you bothering me? His response is, ooh, tell me more about the implications of that. <laughs> ooh, and we'll go and have that, that <laughs> conversation. Um, you know, and, and I've, I've told other people in the past that one of the things that, that whenever I go to David and I say, why did you do X with this? Because, you know, as, as somebody who's, who's a naval analyst who studied a lot of naval history, sometimes, you know, the initial thought is, is, is that right? Is that, you know, why, why did that happen? And I always tell people that, like, I'll get, David will get, like, two minutes into the explanation, I'll go, okay, you got it. Roger that. I know exactly why you did it. You did it for all the right reasons. This is great. And then uh, 20 yeah, minutes later, he gets yeah. me to shut up. <laughs> <laughs> but, it, but, I mean, it's, it's, it's always, it, one of the things about this group that's always a pleasure is that, is that one of two things happen when you say something. You usually either get somebody going, yes, that's exactly the point. Oh, wow, let me spin off of that. Or you get other people that say, wait a minute, I don't know about that. Tell me more. I want to know more about that. And that's, you know, we pair people in fun, and that's the fun part. Another big aspect of this is the degree of mutual respect that the members of BU9 have for one another. That's huge. Mm -hmm. um, this is a group of people who can acknowledge that I have strengths here, you have strengths there, and everyone is, I don't know the best way to put it, everyone is receptive and supportive that doesn't mean that they're just going to rubber stamp something they think isn't going to work. But even if they don't think it's going to work, nobody ever goes, oh, my God, you know, when somebody comes up with an idea. Instead, they say, well, how do you see that working? And frequently what happens is the, 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 the concept that may have been flawed when it was first tossed out, you know, after 45 to 90 minutes of going around the table, something very strong and very usable comes out of it because everybody jumps on in how do we make this work rather than that's the stupidest thing I ever heard. All right. And that is, I think, a big part of what makes you guys work. And it's one reason why those long, exhaustive marathons where we hook up the laptops and talk to Australia and whatnot, depending on the time zone at, at, at HonorCon, why they, they, they work as well as they do. And it's why even when I've like, you know, there, there have been times when I've been tried to explain something six times and clearly the connection isn't getting made. 
okay but it's not that it's not getting made because people aren't paying attention it's not getting made because it's because there's something that i'm trying to get across that i haven't found exactly the right handle for that person to to and 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 when that moment comes when the handle is found and things click into place that's magic yeah and i okay. i remember um I don't think it was this latest annual meeting. I think it was the one before that where I, I don't I don't remember what the topic was, but there was something where you were saying you were trying to get that idea across and it finally clicked for me. And I and I remember saying, no, 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 I understand what he says. I, I understand what he means. Give me a, give me a second. <laughs> let me explain it. Let me let me convert it into B9 speak. <laughs> um, so that, that's I was telling Tom about a conversation I had with Andy at one point uh, uh, as Tom and I were driving down here to uh, to Wake Forest um, where. I can't remember what the topic was, but Andy had said something to me. And I said, well, you know, there's this cultural aspect to that, too. And I gave a, my brief little, you know, 10 seconds of thought on the cultural aspect. And he sort of looked at me and he said, why do you always go to the cultural stuff rather than having the technical <laughs> stuff? And I looked at him and I said, because you and Bill have the technical stuff down and I don't need to explain any of that to you because you got there first. So, you know, I'm... In my day job, I can be a technical guy, but when I'm talking with Bill and Andy, I don't have to be a technical guy because, A, they're more technical. They're going to explain it to me. But I am the guy who can say, Let, you know, here's the cultural thing I see. That's what I bring to that conversation is that other part that the, that the engineers don't necessarily gravitate towards right away. Well, and it helps that because of the background of the members of, of Bucon, of B9, excuse me, they're not speaking a foreign language to each other when they start throwing these concepts around. Some of them may have a more in-depth, detailed knowledge of parts of it than someone else. Oh. But there's, there's a, an ability to communicate that is, I think you guys may be communicating on a deeper level than you realize that I see looking from the outside in. That you're a group of people because of your common interests and so forth. You have a common lexicon that that allows you to work together as as well as you do. And they've and, read the books. Well, that yeah. that probably helps too. Well, and there there's been multiple times. I mean, in my job at the Center for Naval Analysis, I spent a lot of time at sea. I was a naval analyst specializing in in anti-submarine warfare exercise reconstructions, and in addition to being a war game designer. So, I mean, I spent a lot of time hanging out with the Navy, and there's been a half dozen times where Andy and I would, who's a naval officer, and Joel, who's a former naval officer, and and uh, Bill, who was uh, uh, in the Navy also, he was a chief, and we'd be having a conversation, and I'd turn to Tom to, to make sure that he was up to speed on stuff, and I'd start to say, okay, what we're talking about is, and he'd go, you're talking about blah, 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 and I'd go, oh. <laughs> and the thing is, you know, Tom was never in the Navy but he is an obsessive compulsive researcher. So <laughs> there was a lot of stuff like... And he's fallen into low company. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So there's, so there's a lot of stuff about like um, the Navy's done a lot of work on human factors interface design for next generation warfare systems. And the right answer when you're talking about, if you want to know or talk to a BU-9 person about that sort of stuff, you don't come to any of us who worked with the Navy, you go to Tom because Tom's the guy who did all the research on that aspect of it. And so now it's at the point where I'm asking Tom questions about things like that and can he point me to research materials, etc. Well it helps that you're all bright, competent people too. There's View nine like like we said is twenty four uh, uh more or less. Uh, people, not all of whom were mentioned, they're all valuable members of BU9, though. I don't want anybody to, to think that if we didn't mention somebody, that means they're not important. Um, BU9 people have a tendency to contribute as they are able. Um, so sometimes there will be somebody that we don't, you know, that's, that's not heavily involved in a particular project because it's not their forte or they just don't have mm -hmm. the time right now. And then they come roaring back with the next project. So. Um, I want to make sure that everybody understands that that everybody who's listed as a member of BU9 is a valuable contributor, even if we didn't specifically give them a shout oh, out. Oh, absolutely. And I tend to interface much more heavily, heavily, most heavily of all with Tom. 
uh, but with the folks who have been able to get together for the face-to-face -face meetings. Um, and I mentioned the fact that uh, we had the computers set up. I mean, we literally were talking to, what, at least three different continents mm -hmm. yeah, uh, like at the yeah. last one. Yep. Uh, and, this, and we're talking to people who I've never met face-to-face -face, uh, in, in, in many cases, but who are contributing to the design of the orders of chivalry. Uh, to the the awards, to the organization of the uh, the um, Army. Andromani Army. <laughs> yeah, Mar Marcus Wilms um, from Germany is so there's on that stuff. A lot of stuff going on here, and and Chris is absolutely right that there are a lot more people involved here than are sitting around the podcast table uh, right now, and every one of them. Um, is a valuable part of the overall system we're talking about here. Well, we've been talking with David Weber and members of BU9, the Honorverse Consulting Group Extraordinaire, and uh, all the other uh, BU9 members are here in spirit with us, obviously. Uh, BU9 Associates, thank you so much for being with us. And David, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And now here is part 35 of the complete audiobook serialization of Larry Correa's Hard Magic, as read by Bronson Pinchot. This portion of Hard Magic is provided by Audible.com. Get the complete audiobook at Audible.com now. If you are not a subscriber, you can get the entire audiobook free, or choose from more than 100,000 other titles when you try Audible free for 30 days. Here's the setup for what's coming up. It's the 1930s in America, but this is an America that has been magically changed. In the 1860s, a handful of people from all walks of life were visited with special magical talents, and each generation more are so affected. These people are called actives. Most actives use their powers for good, but some do not. Jake Sullivan is a private eye. He's also a former soldier, an ex-con, and an active heavy, the type of active that controls the force of gravity. Jake has been recruited by a mysterious secret organization of actives dedicated to seeing humanity through a possible magic-based apocalypse. These are known as the Grimnor Knights. If the Grimnor are to be believed, the evil forces of magic introduced into the world have reached a peak, and the apocalyptic finale for humanity may be about to begin. Here's Bronson Pinchot with Part 35 of the complete audiobook serialization of Larry Correa's Hard Magic. Chapter 15 And on this momentous day, let us remember the brave sacrifice of junior assistant third engineer Harold Ernest Crozier of Southampton, who was lost after an ice collision on our maiden voyage. His natural magical gifts combined with his great moral fortitude, enabled him to control the incoming waters before there was any other loss of life. He was a credit to the active race. We shall now have a moment of silence for Engineer Crozier. Captain Edward J. Smith of the RMS Titanic on its fifth anniversary cruise, 1917. Lick Hill, California there were four guards manning the main gatehouse. Three were playing a game of poker while the last was watching the clock, knowing that they were due to be relieved at two o'clock in the morning, and he was dying to get out of the stinking concrete shed and back into his bed. He cursed the slow clock, lit another cigarette, and went back to being miserable. It was a joke. The entire assignment was a big, stupid joke. Nothing ever happened at Lick Hill. After the Great War showed the absolute war-ending power of the peace ray, every nation that could afford it built at least one. America had three along its west coast alone. The peace ray was a marvel of super science. It fired a near-instantaneous beam of absolute death as far as 300 miles in a perfectly straight line. No army could invade a country with a peace ray. Everyone knew that Tesla had made war obsolete. The towers were absurdly tall and usually put on top of the highest land available. 
They were a line-of-sight weapon. The higher it was, the further it could engage targets. When the war had first ended, strings of observation dirigibles had been stationed all along the coast, ready to call in a warning and firing coordinates to the huge crews of operators at a moment's notice. Hundreds of technicians were protected by thousands of soldiers. The sheer amount of electricity necessary to run the machine necessitated the building of huge power plants, but it was all necessary for national security. The guards were well-trained and issued the finest safety equipment. They had to be. A full-charge firing of the peace ray could actually turn the very air around the beam into poison. Only the bravest of soldiers were assigned to guard the most important weapon in the arsenal of freedom. The peace ray was the key to assuring America's safety in the dangerous new world. Or so they had said in 1920 when they'd built the damn things, but over time... Thousands of soldiers had turned into hundreds and then into two understaffed platoons. Hundreds of technicians had turned into a skeleton crew of 30. Budget cuts had taken away all but 10 of their blimps. Half of those were in the shop, and the rest were expected to watch the coast from Canada to Mexico. Their gas masks hadn't been pulled out in years. The private wasn't even sure where his was. The army budget had been so deeply cut over the last three years that he wasn't even sure if they had gas masks at all for the new guys. The power plants had mostly been diverted to feed the growing metropolis of San Francisco, and the last he'd heard from one of the techs, they were running at maybe 15% of maximum power, but that wasn't supposed to matter because nobody knew that, and as long as the peace ray rose over the coast like a deadly futuristic sentinel— it would do its job as a deterrent, or at least that's what the brass figured. Guarding a peace ray was a crap job, but at least he had a job, the private thought ruefully, which was more than he could say for a lot of folks he knew. Times were tough, so three square meals and a bed in a barracks wasn't that bad of a deal if you thought about it, but one thirty in the morning was a lousy time to be thinking about it. There was a tinkle of breaking glass and a grunt. He turned, expecting to see that one of his buddies had dropped their coffee mug, ready to give them some grief about the mess, but he paused, realizing that the spreading stain on the floor was too red to be coffee. Somebody was moving around his friends, who had all put their heads down on the table. Who are you? Then the stranger dressed in funny black pajamas and a mask came across the guard shack with a flash of steel and separated the private's head cleanly from his neck. Mar Pacifica, California. Something's wrong. Faye woke up with a start. She was breathing hard, sweating, and had kicked her blankets onto the floor. The house creaked a bit as the wind from the ocean was strong tonight, but other than that it was quiet. Everything looked normal. The room was dark, but she'd never had a problem seeing better than most folks at night. She'd always figured it was because of her gray eyes. Something ain't right. She knew to pay attention to her instincts. It was like when she traveled. If she paid attention how she was supposed to, she just somehow knew when things were going to be dangerous in the space she was about to fill. Faye got out of bed and pulled on a pair of pants under her baggy nightshirt. Some folks might think pants on a girl were scandalous, but frankly she didn't care what people thought, and if you were going to go sneaking around because something bad was in the air, pants made more sense. She didn't bother with shoes, as her soles were like saddle leather, but she did pick up the big forty-five automatic that Mr. Browning had given her. He said that next time she needed to shoot somebody, this one would put a proper hole in them. Frances had told her that it was probably too powerful for a girl, but she'd been milking cows and had a stronger grip than the city boy did, so what did he know? The hallway was quiet. She padded down the thick carpet of the second-floor balcony, there was nothing moving in the space below or on the stairs. She used her power to check her surroundings. Having had a lot of practice recently, she'd gotten even better at scouting before a jump, so good, in fact, that it was like she could see everything in a big circle around her, not with her eyes, but inside her brain. The area around her had always been like a map in her head, and when she picked a spot to travel into, she could focus more on that space but she'd been traveling so much lately that she'd discovered that her head map had gotten bigger and clearer, 
It was almost like her thoughts could travel on their own, and she didn't even need to send her body to see what was going on. A big book Mr. Browning had, written by a Dr. Fort, had called her power by the name of teleportation, but even it hadn't mentioned anything about being able to have a magic map in her head. Faye checked her head map. It used to only stretch for about fifty feet in a circle wherever she was standing, but with practice it now seemed to go about double that. It didn't have a lot of detail, so she didn't feel like she was invading anyone's privacy, and besides, something was fishy tonight besides the ocean. Mr. Sullivan's room was next to hers, but it was empty. Next was Delilah's room, and she was surprised to find that both of them were asleep in the same bed. That was a little shocking to her since they weren't married folk, so she kept going. She liked Delilah and just hoped Mr. Sullivan would make her happy. Nobody was moving on the second floor, so she decided to travel downstairs. Grandpa had always warned her not to travel into a spot where she couldn't see with her own eyes, but she'd been breaking a bunch of his rules lately. She appeared in the fancy dining room. There was something in the shadows behind the piano, but it turned out to just be a curtain moving a little in the breeze from an open window. The map in her head didn't show anything weird. Even the servants were perfectly still, sleeping, standing up in their bare quarters. She didn't know what they were. They sure as heck weren't people, but darn if they couldn't fix a mighty fine sandwich. Then at the very edge of her map, something twitched. She checked the spot in the living room, clear, and traveled. Her bare feet appeared an inch off the carpet, and she landed with the lightest thump. In the dark ahead of her was a shape, dressed entirely in black, crouched low, doing something to the magic carvings on the wood around the big glass windows. There was a scratching noise as the visitor flicked a knife back and forth. Her first inclination was to just take Mr. Browning's forty-five and shoot the stranger in the back of the head, but she'd promised Lance that she'd try extra hard not to kill anybody else by accident, and she was afraid that this might just be another grim noir that she didn't know. Lance had said that there were hundreds of them. Can I help you? Fay asked politely. The person's head whipped around. He was wearing a black mask under a hood. A pair of gray eyes seemed to glow in the dark, then they just disappeared. Traveler! Fay felt the air behind her move and she reacted on instinct, traveling. She could almost feel the knife drive through the space she'd just occupied. She landed on the other side of the couch. The stranger's hand snapped through the air and Fay jerked to the side just as something metal passed her face. A four-sided metal razor embedded into the wall with a thunk. Hey! Faye shouted. Then she disappeared just as the stranger threw another razor at her. She landed on the second floor. She'd never been in Lance's room before and almost managed to impale herself on the antlers from a stuffed elk. Lance! Lance! Wake up! Huh? Lance immediately sat up in bed, his hand flying to a holstered revolver hanging from the bedpost. Faye? There's a traveler and he's trying to kill. Her instincts warned her that something was coming, and she threw herself back just as the stranger appeared, swinging a knife for her throat. There was a terrible bloom of fire and the man crashed back into the wall. Damn ninjas, Lance bellowed as he fired five more rounds in rapid succession. Faye covered her ears. The stranger was still sliding down, leaving a trail of blood on the wallpaper as Lance sprang out of bed and turned on the electric lamp. You hurt, he shouted as he dropped the empty revolver and picked up a lever-action rifle from the bedside. I hate damn ninjas, he worked the action. Faye realized that he was as hairy as the animals he controlled and bucked naked to boot. She shrieked, pointing. Lance looked down, swore again, and covered himself with the rifle butt. I sleep like this, old camping habit, never mind. Hell, go get Browning, he ordered. Faye traveled to Browning's room and froze as the old man sat up in bed, aimed a shotgun right at her face and pumped around into the chamber. Faye screamed and traveled off to the side. It's me. I near blasted you, young lady, Browning admonished as he lowered the shotgun. Who's shooting? What's going on? 
The grim noir sure did wake up fast. At least he was wearing pajamas. There was a traveler, and he tried to stab me, but Lance shot him a bunch and said he was a damn ninja. Browning just nodded, placed the shotgun on the bed beside him, did something with his grim noir ring, made a fist with his ring hand, and slammed it jarringly hard into his palm. We are under attack, he said. We are under attack. He was already waking up from the sudden banging, but Sullivan rolled out of bed even faster as someone bellowed the words directly into his ears. What? he shouted. Delilah was already up and moving, throwing her clothes on. Gunfire! O was yelling. What? Sullivan's sleep-filled head realized that it had been Browning's voice, but of course, Delilah didn't have a grim noir ring, so she wouldn't have heard. He had put Pershing's ring on his pinky, the only one of his massive digits it would fit. Never mind. He grabbed the thick forty-five from the nightstand. There was enough light coming through the window that Sullivan could see her throwing her dress over her head in a terrible hurry. It reminded him of when he'd had to flee New Orleans just ahead of the law. Delilah looked at him, eyes wide. Just like old times, huh? He drew back the slide of the automatic and let the oiled steel fly forward under spring pressure, chambering around. Yeah, just like old times. Only I ain't running this time. That was part 35 of the complete audiobook serialization of Hard Magic by Larry Correa, read by Bronson Pinchot. And that's it for the podcast. Thanks to Audible.com and to podcast theme composer Ruth Judkowitz. Anna Cash of newly discovered wormholes leading to systems unknown, a 21 laser cannon salute through a dusty part of space so you can actually see it, and as swag a personal impeller wedge to take them into 2015 at the speed of thought, to Honorverse creator David Weber and the members of Honorverse consulting group Bu9 all of whom are authors of House of Steel, The Honorverse Companion, Volume 1, and upcoming House of Lies, The Honorverse Companion, Volume 2. Happy Thanksgiving, and please join us next time here at the hammering heart of science fiction and fantasy storytelling. And keep reaching for the stars. Bye.